Well, thank you everybody for joining. Today, we're going to be talking about UI tweaking and UI options out there. I get a lot of questions about whether we can change colors, you know, do custom titles, things like that. So I'm just going to go through a whole bunch of stuff that you can do to customize the UI for the end users. Now, this doesn't take into consideration any of the branding that you can do or anything like that. This is going to be more on some of the either lesser known or, or just the ones you don't need very often. Just to get everybody on the same level, we're going to start off just by talking about searching. See, AP invoices, perfect. So I'm going to search through AP invoices for things. The first thing I want to talk about is the global searching up here versus the searching down here in the record type screen. The global search up here searches across everything you have access to, okay? Every record type you have access to, and it searches for data values that match, it searches in record notes and full text searches, things like that. And so it'll, it'll pretty much search all of that at the same time and bring everything up in groups of kind of bundled by record types of what matched, which works fine if you're just looking for something that's very unique, you know, a purchase order invoice number, things like that can be fairly unique. So you might only get one or two hits and that works out pretty good. But if you were, were to search for something like Smith, uh, and you have 10 record types, you might find something in every one of them that's hard to break that down a little bit. So one thing to keep in mind is the global search up here across searches all record types, but there's also a global search down here in the record type itself. If I type in Smith here, it's only gonna find Smith in this record type, AP invoices, okay? So if you still want the flexibility of searching all your, your full text data and your notes and all that, but you wanna make sure you limit it to only a record type, you just go down here and do it rather than doing up in the, in the header. Searching is pretty straightforward. You pick your record type. Uh, you can pick it over here on the dropdown, it says search. It's the same dropdown over here. It's just in two different places to make it easy. So all the searching stuff's in one, one place over here. Plus some people like to see the search name and see it over there. It doesn't matter how you get there. Whichever one you select, it's gonna pop up this window here uh, to do some searching on. So you have all your defined record type fields here. Uh, these are your fields you've defined, text, drop downs, dates, numbers, things like that. And we'll go through some samples here on that in a minute. But then you, like I said, also have that global search down below. You can also change your sorting down here, and you can change the number per page. You can default this in the record type to maybe you want to set them all to 50, but then you always have the ability to override that when you're doing an actual search. Now, one of the less well-known things is the reverse sort. So you have actually a last added search. If I just hit search without doing anything, it's going to show me all of the records, the oldest on top and the newest on the bottom. Okay, and there's multiple pages here. If I always want to see the most recent records, I can go to the search and instead of hitting this search button, I can hit this button that does them in reverse order. So now the newest one, the latest one is on top. So if you're doing importing and you're testing things like that, you always want to see, okay, which one's just imported? Go to your record type, search them in reverse order, the, the newest ones will be up top. So keep that in mind, it's great for troubleshooting. There's also a shortcut for that in the dropdowns. And this search, this little nine to one over here on the right does the same thing. So if I come up here to AP invoices and click here, it's gonna do the same search. So with one click, well, two, one, two, uh, you can actually do a reverse sort to get to the last records in that record type. And it works here as well. That's something a lot of people don't remember. They've seen it before and don't think about it. But as you're doing importing and testing and things like that, that's a great way to get to the last record real quickly. Don't forget about the tabs across the top of the search screen too. This is another thing that let's say, unless you use them every once in a while, you kind of forget they're there. These are your fields you define, but you can also search on things such as the status of the record. So only admins can do a status of deleted. You can actually look at your recycle bin. And from here, you can restore and purge. Okay, so if, now if I do a search for all the deleted records, these are all deleted. Let's say I check a couple of them on here. I have options to restore those or purge them because they're deleted. If I had done a, an active search, done the same thing, check on a couple of records here, I can delete them. So that's one difference between whether you're searching active or deleted records. But instead of having a recycle bin, everything now is done with the record status change. And like I said, only admins get this option. You can search by record ID. If somebody gives you a record ID, you can search for a multiple record IDs, one per line, and they'll search and find all of those. You can search by who created the record, who changed the record, 
the date ranges of when they were created and, and changed. And that's the last change, not immediate changes, but um, the last change. And if you have retention hold on your record or if you're in your favorites, okay. Lesser used, but just don't forget they're there. Because if you get into retention hold scenarios, it's nice to be able to find the ones that are have a hold on them or don't have a hold. The next tab is document fields. You can search by document ID, category, subcategory, name. And what this is going to do is it's going to find records that match that criteria. Okay, it doesn't necessarily look for documents. It says now look for all of the records that have a document in this category. When they were created, when they were last updated, similar to the records, whether the record has documents or not. Sometimes you're looking for records in a record type that don't have any documents. Okay, so you can just click there and do that search. It'll show you the ones that don't have any documents. Or maybe you're looking for a document count. Show me all the ones that have between five and 100 documents. Or a page count. Let's say I want to, I have a thing from one to 10 pages. So it'll find any record that has a total number of pages in it between one and 10, inclusive. Okay. One thing to keep in mind with this though is a document that's just been uploaded but never been viewed or OCR'd or rendered in any way shows up as zero pages until it is first opened up or OCR'd or some operations performed on it. We don't take the time to paginate all your documents until you need them to be paginated. So page counts don't include any documents that have never been paginated. Just keep that in mind. Typically, with most scenarios, you're doing some kind of OCR or something, so it's not much of an issue, but there are times when that comes up. And then being able to detect if the record has documents with or without OCR. All right, so those are regular search fields, record fields, document fields. Now we get into custom fields. Now in custom fields, if everybody knows the system, you don't have to define all your fields, right? So let's just pull one of these open real quick here. I'm just gonna go look at a record. If I edit that record and then go to raw data, there's a bunch of fields in here that have never been defined. So for instance, uh, let's see. Uh, that one's defined, of course, when you look here. Uh, so let's say uh, split by, at split by, something like that. That's a field you wouldn't define, but it's in there. And if you wanted to find all the records where at split by equals doc management agent, you could actually do that. If you go to your custom search fields and add a field, type in at split by, okay, you can find all of the document or all the records that have that field with that value. So, and like I said, one thing I preach about the system is you don't have to define all your fields. In fact, I don't like you to define all your fields because it becomes too unwieldy for the users to have 50 fields in a search screen, right? But you can still find records by using this custom field search, right? Uh, if it's a date, you can put ranges in here. If you need to. Things like that. But any of these fields behind the scenes that you don't normally see, you can still get to them easy enough. Okay. And terms is a good one. I don't think we had terms defined. So let me look at that. Yeah, so terms is not a defined field, but I can still find where terms equal net 30, for instance. In fact, I know I messed up that search. Let me just go to another one. Custom add terms at 30. There you go. All of these have net 30 in them. Just to make sure, I'm going to go edit. Of course, it's not there. I got to look at the raw data. Terms net 30. So custom searching becomes very handy, especially for you as you're uh, troubleshooting, debugging, if you're importing data and you don't have defined fields on it. Now keep in mind, if you're doing a lot of testing on terms, like for instance, go ahead and make it a defined field initially and use it so it's available on your regular search page, whatever, you can see it in search results if you want to. But if you don't need to use it after your troubleshooting and your setup period, then just go delete the field. The data is still there. You just get rid of the field anytime you want to. Okay. But you can still get to all that hidden data that you've been tugging it, uh, plugging on into your records through this screen. There's some workflow options too. Find all the ones that are assigned to me or not. Or you can find all the, all the records that are in a specific work trigger or process. So for instance, I have a bunch of work triggers on this system. I could say, show me all the ones that are actually in the invoice review step. Okay. Or I could say, I could go up a level and say, show all the ones that are in the invoices process. 
which will show me anything that's in any of these triggers down below. I can go all the way up to the top level, AP automation, and it'll show you all the records that are in any of these, the batches, invoices, and vendors. Now, these aren't normally uh, what a normal user might use to search, but it's handy for you. And if, if a customer or somebody needs it, you can actually show them how to do this. This is essentially going to make a report that runs for them, even if they don't have reporting rights. Show me all the records of this step. So now let's say that you're looking for several invoices by invoice number. This is the invoice number column here. And I want to find uh, several invoices at the same time. Now you have an invoice number field here, but all you can do is type in one invoice number. On the right hand side of all these fields, you can toggle that to be multi line or multi value if I should. So for instance, I could do these four up here 2276, enter. 1685, enter. 1175, enter. And 2173. Do my search. And there's those four come up. Now, what's nice about this is you can get spreadsheets and end users will get spreadsheets sent to them, maybe by management saying, hey, we need to see all these. Or maybe an auditor sends you a spreadsheet or a list of all of the criteria that they want to find or the invoice numbers or whatever it is they're looking for. You can copy those directly out of the spreadsheet column, paste them in here and hit search. You can find them all at the same time. It makes it much easier. But you can do the same thing with date fields. Just put one date per line, number fields, even drop downs. You can do the same thing. Last searches and last records. Don't forget how to use these. This is very handy, especially um, I use this for training customers as well. Anytime you do a search, it logs it. And the last 10 searches you just did show up in this drop down over here. When you click the little arrow that points down. If I click the last search button by itself, it'll actually run that one last search, the last one you did. And there's those four invoices we just found. And it added another one at the top of the same search. So that was the last two I did were the same. And then we had, remember the net 30 search we did and all that. So this is a great shortcut for people, especially if you're jumping around and you're doing a couple searches. Oh, what was that I just found? You can just drop it down and it'll show you what you searched for. Okay. Now, last record is similar. It'll actually take you to the last record you were in. If you're in a record and you click last record, it'll actually go to the next to last record you're in. So you can actually use it as a toggle to go back and forth between two records. If I click it again, it'll come back to the first one I was in. And it keeps track of the last 10 records you were in. So I can jump back to the eighth one if I want to. So those are great shortcuts. And even the people who've been using the system for a while, they don't think about using them. I, I just got used to using them. I just, I just think they're incredibly helpful. If you'll notice, the date fields and number fields actually have a range of, because then you can search between two dates and between two numbers. And they are inclusive. So if you search, for instance, from uh, one to 100 here, it's going to find an invoice that's one and anything that's up to 100 inclusive. Okay, So it's one to 100. But you can also do some other fun things. For instance, in this invoice date, let's say that you wanted to build something for the CFO of the company and you want to find invoices that were paid last month or that came due next month, something along those lines. You could do, let's just do last month here, I'll say from March, 30, March 1st through the 31st. Okay, That's on the invoice date. There's all the invoices where the invoice date was between the 1st and the 31st. And you notice everything's in March. It's good. And that'll work fine. You can train the CFO how to do his or her own searches to go, you know, look at last month's data, next month's data. But we got a really cool feature. If you click the button in the middle, it toggles your date mode. So instead of being a date selector, it's actually free form text. Now I can put in, I can still type in the numbers I wanted to. I could have done that in the other view too. But the nice thing about this is being able to use variables. So I could do something like this. That'll say, Everything from 30 days ago till whatever the, what is in the right. So I could use a new, fairly new variable we added called month start and month end. I could say month start minus one. That means the beginning of last month. We go through the end of last month by using month end minus one. Hit search. Now you'll notice we get the same results back. It still shows the first through the 31st, but we used variables to do it. What's the bonus? The bonus is if I save this search and run it next month, these are going to evaluate to April 1st and April 30th. 
So every time it runs, it reevaluates what is last month and what's the first day of it and what's the last day of last month. So you could save this search, share it with the CFO, and the CFO runs it. Whatever day he or she is running it, it's going to run the previous month. So you don't have to train them on how to do it. You can just send them a search and it'll always work. Now, if I save this, I could just say invoices from last month or something like that. Just give it a friendly name. And it always shows up here in my drop down invoices from last month. Okay, so no matter where I am, come back here, invoices for last month. Notice it's plugging in the month start, month end, and it evaluates to last month. You can combine that with other things as well. You could find things where the amount is over so much last month. Uh, you could do the due dates instead of the invoice dates. So I could say, let's toggle the due date and go month start. And then month end, but instead of doing a negative one, we'll do a positive one. I don't think I have any data that's due next month. Maybe I do. No, nope, none. Uh, let's do this month just so I think we have some stuff due this month. Yeah, there we go. So you can show the CFO what is coming up, kind of coming due either this month or next month. And the CFOs like to see their spend coming up, you know, for the next month. So variables are a great way of building reports because really when it comes down to it, when somebody says, I need a report that shows me all the invoices that are coming due or that were paid or whatever by vendor, that kind of thing, what they're really talking about is a search, okay? And using variables, you're able to set up a search for them that'll always work based on certain criteria. You hard code some values, maybe there's a status of paid, you have to have a, they have to be paid. And then you have the month end and month start being variables. Um, you get it set up the way they want it, and then you save it and share it with them. Now, how do you share it with them? A couple of things you can do. You can just take this URL up here, just take it, copy it, and send it to them an email. When they run it, it's going to pull the criteria from search number 8410. But when they run it, it's going to turn into 8411, 8412, whatever the next search number is, and it's going to save it as one of their searches. So you're just sending them criteria, and then when they run it, it becomes their search. So Likewise, if the question always comes up, what if I send them a search that has data in it that they're not supposed to see? Well, if you do a search and you send them that search, you're not actually sending them a list of records. You're sending them the search criteria. So it'll be reevaluated under their, their uh, security parameters. So if they're not supposed to see Bob's burger joint for some reason, because you've got them excluded in security, they won't see that one come up in the search. You're just sending the criteria to them. So the other way you can share it is you can, like I said, you can take the URL up here if you want to, or if, once you've saved it, you can actually click this little share search button. And what this does is the same thing. It just copies it to your clipboard. Okay. Now, other fun things we can do with searching. Now, let's talk about something else comes up on the UI side with regards to reporting is charts, graphs, things of that nature. So. With invoices, this is a good good example to use. There's actually, and I kind of skipped it when we were talking about the tabs before, but on this last one, there's a charting tab, okay? So you can chart based on an x-axis, y-axis. So there's always has to be a date field at the bottom. It's really centered around date oriented. So let's do, let's just say we're doing due date. I'm gonna chart based on due date. And then the amount x, I'm gonna use for the amount field, just the total amount of the invoice. So that's the amount of the invoice by due date. I'll group it later. Right now, I'm just going to say do a line chart and then hit run. So now it'll do the same search as before, but now at the top, you'll have a line chart. Okay. You could also choose in bar chart, area charts, things like that. Uh, the two most common are the line and the bar. Now, the other thing you can do is some grouping. It's, it just has a one level grouping. Uh, you can group by, let's say, vendor, for instance. And I'm going to go back to my line chart because I think it looks nicer. Now it's actually broken down by vendor. You've got your color codes at the top, which I will mention this will be, this is actually going to be customizable in the next release. Hasn't been out there yet. I was hoping to get it done by this release, but didn't get it in there. But then the colors will be customizable as well. But you can see all of the, these, this color is your 8X, new course, all these come show up. Now if you turn, if you click on the headers up here, you can turn them on and off. So let's say you didn't want to see the forward one. Click on it, forward goes away, everything else is there. I can just go across here and just turn them all off and go, okay, now let me show copy works. 
parish copy rolls. Looks like we only have one invoice from them this year. Or Bob's Burger Joint. Not a whole lot there either. I'll do one more update here. Oh, let's do a radar chart. It's always interesting to look at. I think it's hard to understand, but some people like it. Once you have this, then let's say that that uh, let's go back to the line chart. It's easier to easier to look at for me anyway. So now let's say this is what you want to give the CFO. OK, do the same thing. You can either send them the search link. You could do a save of it, which I prefer doing the saving myself. So hit the save button over here um, with charts. Now, every time you run that in, that search. There it is. It's a nice looking report. They have the data down below, charts up above, you can kind of toggle things on and off. I could have given it a better title than amount up here. I didn't really spend a lot of time on that, but there's your title, your chart title down here. But this then, you save this, and this becomes a really nice report for a CFO or a manager or somebody like that to review. Then you can go one step further and you can embed this onto your home page. On the home page, we have, you know, you can do searches, of course, here. You can look at your own workflow. You can look at your own workflow charts, but you can also embed things such as searches here. So now if I look next to the share link here, this is the one we just did, A, B, invoices with charts. I have two options. I can put the search on my home page or the chart on my home page. So I'm going to do the search. Notice now we have this new tab that comes up. Ah, and there it is. I could also then embed the chart now we have a custom charts so if they don't want to have to run this search which really isn't that big a deal if that's their biggest search you can actually run here and then they can go set as my start page every time they log in they'll come right to the search if they don't like that or if you don't think it's easy for them you can put them on here then they have all their own stuff along with their saved stuff And if you click on one of those items, it'll actually break it down and show you. Something I forgot to show you before. Oops, I'll let me go back to here. There. So if I do this search and I want to see, okay, wait a minute. New course has one in July. Let me click on that. And it'll actually break down the new courses. There we go. All the new courses here. Due date in July. And then you can hit back to your search. Sorry, I skipped that piece. So if you get asked for reports, the first thing I always think about is how can I make a search for it? Whether or not they need a chart, completely up to you. Um, some people don't care about them. Some people love them. I will tell you, it makes a great demo. I'm sure some of the guys on this call can attest to that. If you just can bring up the search and show them something like this or show them the homepage with, a, with that charting on it, it does make a nice demo. If you have multiple on there, let's see, throw one here, put that one on there, something like that. So you have multiple charts up here. And whatever tab you're on when you leave the screen, that's what you'll come back to. So if I go do a search and then come back home, I still am on that charts page. If I click over here, this is the page I'll come back to. So whichever tab you have active is what you come back to. Then I can always click the search button to see all the records from that. And if I want to get rid of it, I can get rid of it. If I'm an administrator, this is something you guys can use. Uh, let's say that you want to share this custom search with a group of people. You can click on the share and say, OK, I want to go to the accountants. And anybody who's an accountant, I'm going to share it with. So admin, not too much there. Do I have any more here? I guess I don't have a big team, but uh, not really. Anyway, you can break it down by user. Actually, I can just do it this way. I'm going to share it with all these people. And it puts it on their home page, just like you have. So you get a call from a customer. Hey, I need this report and I want to share it with everybody in the AP department. Well, OK, make your report, get it going, come over here, share it with people. Um, but there's one other option. If you're on the Enterprise Edition, um, or I should say why there's another option. If they if you put it on their home page, they can delete it off there. OK, no big deal. But if the powers that be in their organization say, no, we need to make sure they always have it available. Don't let them delete it. You can actually go into the team level. 
and pull up their team. Let's just say we're going to go with um, this one. And then down here in the shared homepage searches, there's actually a search ID that's created or a saved search ID, and you can put that in there. And then it puts it on their homepage, and they can't remove it. So, for instance, if I go up here and I edit, uh, let's just do this one. Right up top, it shows me what the search, saved search ID is, 80. Okay. If I go to this team and I put 80 here, that saved search will always show up on everybody that's in the team. It'll always be on their homepage, and they can't get rid of it. Okay. So that's kind of the forceful way of doing it. You know, somebody in, in admin or management decides they have to have it on everybody's homepage and you don't want to get rid of it. But it's also an easy way to share something out to a big team that maybe people are going to be added later. You don't know. If you put them in here, as people are added and removed from the teams, that uh, save search will be added and removed from the homepages automatically. You won't have to do it anymore. Uh, one thing else uh, also about the save searches is you can actually do a full uh, edit of them now. So while you're in here, you have the same criteria available to you. I can tweak the charts. I can change the search criteria um, just by hitting that, that edit button up here. Of course, you can delete them as well. There's several things about this screen that kind of jump out. All right. One, you have colored due dates. Okay, the ones that are overdue or coming due or whatever are actually in red. Everything else is in black. And I can show you how to do all this as well. Days overdue. This column is actually auto calculated based on the due date and today. And I can show you how to do that. And, and to go one step further, it's green if it's only so much overdue. It goes orange if it's more overdue. And if it's over so much, I think it's um, up to 25 and not over 50 or something like that. Um, well, I can show you how to set up these, these background colors as well to highlight things. Um, and then you have the progress bars. That's something that I think people have seen them before, but I want to go over how to create those progress fields. So you can actually have a progress bar look in your search. And all of these carry forward when you go into the record as well. Okay, up here, it replicates the exact same look as a search screen. Plus, we have this up here I'll talk about as well. We have a few things, I said, kind of tucked away. I don't say they're hidden necessarily, but tucked away in the system that, that can help you do a lot of these tricks. So if I go to my record type admin, is that other screen open here? And I go to UI design, which is way down here. There we go. Okay. First thing I want to talk about is the record screen title. You can actually customize this title up here. That both the text and the color can be customized. So, and this uses variables. Once again, this is where variables can save you. So what I'm doing here is we have UI design, which is just the name of the record type. I'm just putting that back out there. Oh, and by the way, if you, if you don't put anything in here, it just puts the name of the record type up there. That's the default value. So you don't have to do that specifically, but if you want to customize it, you can do whatever you want. So what I'm doing here is UI design, and I'm saying, okay, if the due date is null, then assume it's due on 1-1-2200, 1, 1, uh, which means it's way in the future. So if it doesn't have a due date, I'm going to act like it's due way in the future. I don't have to worry about it. If that value is less than today, okay, then I'm really not going to, uh, let's see, yeah, then it's overdue. Otherwise, I'm not going to do anything. So this is just using an if statement. So it's if this value up to here is less than this value, then add this text. Otherwise, add nothing because there's nothing here. I could have done something else, but I didn't want anything else. So what that does is it, it just says UI designed if everything's okay, but if it's overdue, it puts dash overdue on it, which is what you say here. And then I do the same thing on the color. If the due date, you know, if it's, if it's null, assume it's way in the future, but if that is less than date, then use red color, otherwise use black. Now you could put hex codes in there if you want to, um, but there's some shortcuts just using the standard red, orange, black, yellow, green, blue. So that can give you an immediate view when somebody opens up the record. Wow, this is okay. It's overdue. Okay. Also, when you do the search, you see it right there as well. Oh no, the search is use a different thing. You have to, that's the color coding. Sorry, um, but I can do the color coding much the same way as I do the the titles. So in the search fields, sorry, in the result fields, there is. If I go into let's see, let's start on due date. If I go look at the due date field. Under display, we have some basic rules you can say. Okay, if if the due date is from 1-1-1990, which means way old, 
up until today, then the background color is black and the text color is red. If it doesn't match that, then just keep it black, which is the default color in the search results. So that's why these are still black, but these are less than today. So, and I'd actually put a date in there. I could have probably put in date, but that's all right. I could have added another one in here, you know, like 4, 21, 20, 23 to whatever. Things like that. It's not, it, it makes more sense on the numeric, but I'll show you that in a minute. But those could be a different color. This could be like an orange or something like that. Speaking of amount, let's go to the amounts. Look at that one. Oh, got the amount. What did I do? Oh, the day's overdue. That's it. Okay. So you can do, and all these fields have it, by the way. Vendor probably doesn't make any sense, but let's say you wanted to always say, ah, uh, the Acme ones, I want to do in purple or something, you know, some weird background color, like a blue because I want to know when the Acme ones are coming up. Then you could do that. Just specifically say, if the vendor equals Acme, use this color and this, this background color, and this foreground color. Okay. Let's go look at days overdue. So this has a couple things. One, it does the same kind of display. If it's from one to 15 days overdue, use green. If it's from 16 to 25, use orange. If it's 26 to 999, whatever, you use red, okay? So that can actually help color code the output over here. But one thing else about this that I talked about is the days overdue is actually an auto computed column. So if we look at the general, there's a computed value. Okay. If I turn that on, then this default value is going to be computed every time this record shows up in a search or is open in, in the record record screen. This value is going to come into the days overdue field. So it's going to evaluate if due date, this, this looks similar to before. If the due date if it has one, otherwise it'll go away in the future. If it's less than today, then take the difference of the due date to today, another variable, the difference of these by days. So it tells you the number of days difference between those two dates. That's where we get the 14, 24, 54. So if you do your math, this is gonna be 14 days, 24, whatever. So this does your math for you. And then that value is then used in the display to say if it's between here and here, go green and orange and red. Now, the tricky thing about these auto calculated fields is this value that's calculated doesn't get saved to the database. Okay, so you can't search on it because it's auto calculated when it's displayed only. So don't try to use this as a search field. In fact, I might go to the advanced and tell it only to be in the search results only. So, yeah, you can see it, but you can't search by it. Don't confuse people by making a searchable column. And of course, I would make it not editable as well, just to make sure they can't try to edit it. And then it just goes, it gets overwritten. They don't know why. Because every time the record loads, it's going to change it anyway. So. so that combines two different types of things, the auto calculated field plus your display properties. Now, the percentage one, completion, just set up a field as a number and use P for the formatting. That's a standard. Microsoft format for percentage, P is percentage. When we see that, we'll convert it automatically to a progress bar, okay? Now, in this case, I went one step further and added those same display properties to override the progress bar colors. So if it's negative 100 to 100 in the completion property, or to a zero, sorry, um, I just leave it alone. Just basically it's a white background with a black text. So um, then if it's from one to 24, of course, red, and you see what happens. So now you can actually say, okay, based on how far along the progress is, you can color code it. Uh, almost done is green, great, you're almost there, but if things are just getting started, maybe start at red, then go to orange, then blue, then green, something like that. What you're really trying to do is just give the end users that, that visual cue, the visual clue of what's going on without having to really look at the data. You can show them very quickly just by looking at the color codes. And people love color coding. But you can't do the full array of variables here because this is not evaluated on the server in the variable processor. This is actually just evaluated on display in the user interface. Um, so you don't have access to everything unless you're doing that auto calculate. Then you can do it here to get your value and then use those values in the display properties. So this these features can make a really nice interface and give give that, that extra punch you need to. To give, give some stimulus to people. We also have the ability to do uh, image fields. 
And I'm not sure if some of you have even seen those before, but you can actually show images in the search results. Um, I, I, I can show you if you'd like, it's basically as any images in the record can, that can be displayed here, but you gotta be careful not to overuse it um, because every time that image displays, it's gonna load that, or the search results display, it's gonna load an image for each one of those, which might slow things down. So you just gotta be judicious on when and how often you use it. So we do use it a lot for displaying signatures. Like as people sign off on things, you can actually show on the left-hand column, the signature of the person who signed for it. Once again, that visual stimulus that the process has done, it's been signed off on. Okay, a couple other things about this screen to show you. Um, by default, we stop, we don't wrap values. We keep everything nice and clean so everything you know, lays out nicely. But if you look at these, these names over here, you can hover over them and you can still see the full value. But sometimes people like to see the entire value, especially if it's very large. You can actually show them how to toggle on these drop-down options turn off the prevent data wrapping. Now the entire value is visible. Did you notice what it does? It kind of staggers things so it doesn't look as clean. That's fine, they can get used to it as well, but that's why we default it this way. It just looks a little nicer and cleaner, but they can definitely turn that off. Another nice feature is this show copy icon. Uh, and this is great for once again, if you're troubleshooting or you're doing things, you can actually turn that on and now watch what happens when I hover. Now I get a little icon that shows up on wherever I'm hovering. So if I click here, it copies whatever it was I whatever I clicked on copy. So if I click on this one, it copies that to your copy buffer. So you can actually very easily copy one value at a time. And it does come in handy when you're doing some editing, like mass editing of records, things like that. Turn that off, turn that off. Okay, another nice feature is this uh, show your sorted value groupings. Uh, and this is also for people who are doing data review. Uh, maybe you're uploading a bunch of data. You want to see when things change. What you can do is if you turn this on, not visually stimulating right now, but then I start sorting. What happens is every value that's unique is blocked together. So I don't know if I have anything in this search or not that's going to work. Here we have a vendors. Perfect. So now, now that it's sorted by vendors, all the Acme ones are boxed in together. Then the Omega, then this big, very long vendor. So you can very quickly, with this feature turned on, skim and see when things change, when a value changes. Whereas if the omega may have been spelled wrong with O-M-A-G-A, for instance, let's do that. Let me change this one to a, the wrong value. I go vendor O-M-A-G-A instead of E-G-A. <clears throat> okay, notice now it's, it's like you're gonna look at this and go, why is that not blocked together? Oh, it's misspelled. Whereas without that turned on, you might have very easily just went on by it thinking it was the same. You wouldn't have noticed the difference. So this helped you spot differences and find problems. We've really simplified our security quite a bit inside of the system where you really just have, you can either have read-write access to a record, you can have read-only access or no access, okay? No access means you don't even see it in the search result, right? You don't, you don't even think it's there. Read-only, you can see it, you can view it, but you can't change anything in it. And of course, read write means you have access to change everything. There are ways you can tweak that a bit though. Let's say that somebody wants to be able to um, read and write the metadata, but not change the documents, okay? Well, inside the record types, if you go to the categories, you can actually add categories here. And as long as people are putting things in categories, you can set security on them. So I can say, okay, even though I get in the record type and I have read write access to make changes to that, I want to make sure I only have read only. Let's see by team here um, to anything. Let's say anybody in the dev team can only have read access to this category. Uh, okay. So now I can get in there. I can edit the metadata if I have rights to. But regardless of what my record rights are, I'm overriding that with the document level rights. Okay. Now you can also flip that scenario and say, okay, I want people to have read-only access to the metadata, but still be able to put documents in. So you can do the same thing. Let's say in the security of the record type, I'm gonna give that dev team read-only access to this record type, but in these categories, I'm sorry, going the wrong way, whatever categories I can say, okay, but in this category, I'm gonna give them the read-write, I'm gonna put the dev team in here. So now, they can get to the record, but they can't change it. But in this category, they have full rights to add and remove and rename and all that. 
to go along with that, take it one step further, you can actually give people the right to add and edit, but you can revoke the right to delete. Okay. Now this one's not as obvious um, because it's really not built into our security system. This is more of a UI change. We're not really revoking the rights to delete, but we're removing all of the user interface commands for deletion. Okay. So if you go underneath the UI settings tab in your record type, I can say, I only want this team to be able to delete. What that means is any teams you select here will have the rights to delete, but nobody else will. Notice that the prompt changes over here. Only read write users and these teams uh, and with read write and read write admins as well, we'll be able to see the delete and replace oriented function. So you can't delete any documents, you can't replace them with new versions, things like that. Now, like I said, we're not really revoking rights. Technically, we're just setting the user interface to hide all those commands so they can't really do it. Similarly, the collaboration portals are kind of along the same lines where people want to be able to maintain the, the records but not delete the portals or mess with the portals. And if you haven't used portals much, don't worry about this feature, I guess, but you can do the same thing. Say only these teams can see the options for maintaining portals. Because without this, then everybody can not only manage the record, but they could also manage the portals and some, some companies, organizations didn't like that. So we gave them the ability to remove it as well. Let's go back to these records here, the UI design records. There are times where you want to be able to give people a little bit faster method of doing things. For instance, you might have an add-in you've designed to do something, and you don't want people to have to click here into add-ins and then click on the add-in. Okay? You can put them right up here if you design your add-in with another option. So if I go to these add-ins, find the UI design ones. When I specify when and where to show, and I say to put it in the record screen, I can turn this one on. That's what tells it to put it up here on the main top bar here. If I don't turn this, this toggle on, then it won't show up here, but it'll still be in the add-ins panel. And there are times when that's preferable. Maybe it's something that people, you don't want normal people to know is there unless you instruct them how to use it, and they won't be tempted to just go click on it. Um, you can just keep it in the add-ins panel, and it's still there, but they just don't have it right in front of them. Now, the opposite of that is there's certain times when you want them to know this feature is available. You just put it right up in front of them and they can get to it. E-forms, kind of similar, and that's why I have this e-form button up here. E-forms, you have to go to the panel to get to them, right? But with the add-ins, oh, I guess I was already there. You can actually tell the add-in to start an e-form and you can tell what e-form to start. So now I can put a button here that actually starts the e-form for them. So they don't have to actually open the panel to get there. Saves them a click, makes it easier. Um, Plus, if you'll notice, that form that just came up wasn't even associated with this record type. So now I can actually control who gets to launch the e-form by setting security on this button. Because on the add-ins, you can actually say, okay, when and where to show, but you can also specify things like, okay, only people in a specific team. If you're in that dev team, for instance. Now, the only people who see that button are the people in the dev team. Nobody else sees it. And since it's not listed as a form associated with its record type, nobody can really start one unless they get access to the button. And that's one of the reasons why I put the add-ins into this UI uh, training, because they actually do help you design the better UI, not just launching. Um, what we normally do with them is just change values and start workflows, but you can do other things with them, such as, like I said, starting an e-form. Or so then over here, you can change document categories. So I could actually say, okay, when it's clicked, I can loop through all the documents that were checked on in the checkbox over here, which you can't see because I don't have any documents, and change their category to whatever you prompted for me. So you can actually prompt for a new category, and whatever they select, they can choose from the dropdown, category one, two, or three. Those are the options I give them. I save that in the new category field. And then as I'm looping through, I use that new category. Now, one of the things you'll notice is I got this XYZ, XYZ here. What happens with this document change properties command is the action will change the active document if there is a document, meaning if they checked one on or they have one open in the add-in, it'll work on that one. But what happens if they don't have one or they have them, but they've closed everything and they click that button? You don't want it to just go find the first document. If, and if you leave this blank, it'll just find the first document and change it. You don't want that to happen. So I'm forcibly saying, 
If they didn't have one selected, then look for one with this category, which there won't be. I'll make sure of it. And it won't operate. It just won't do anything. So this is just a shortcut way of making sure that we don't operate on the wrong documents. I could have done something else. I could have actually put a little action here, throw an exception. If there was no current document, then they would have seen a little box pop up and say you didn't select a document or whatever, but that's just one way of handling it. Now this last button, I put it in mostly for you and your teams. When you're troubleshooting or creating new workflows, uh, one of the most tedious things is testing. Okay, You get your workflow all designed, you have it setting flags and triggers and fields and do whatever it has to do, and you run a document through it and, oh, it didn't work. And then you go look, oh, that was the reason why, you make a change, and you have to make a new record, load a new document, run it through again. Ah, oh, didn't work, make a change. It, we go through this all the time, okay? No matter how good you are, it just happens. So what we like to do is set up uh, add-ins to help us troubleshoot. So let's say you have a problem and make a change. You don't have to keep adding new records. You can just set up an add-in that kind of rearranges the record you're testing and puts it back to the beginning of the workflow, okay? And you do that by updating some record fields. So let's just say you had a field the first workflow step was to see if the approval flag was set, right? So, and maybe in your workflow, you're saying if approval is not is blank, come in here and do my work, right? Well, now you want to start all over again. All you have to do is delete that approval flag. And maybe you had another trigger that was an export flag. Exported is blank. Well, delete that one. So basically what you're doing is resetting all of your workflow flags back to square one, starting everything over again. So now the record looks like it's never really gone through workflow. Then you cancel any current workflows that are on that record and you reroute it. Okay. So one thing to note on this, by default, the cancel work item will cancel and stop processing, turn that off. So now you can update your flags, cancel, but keep going. You don't have to tell it what trigger to go to. If your workflow is set up properly, it'll do it for you. Okay. This is probably one of the most common add-ins I make. Uh, on almost every system, if I have to test more than one or two records, then I start doing stuff like this. Create a real quick add-in. Now when I'm in your testing, oh, it didn't work. I click the button, it cancels everything, reroutes it, running your add-in actions, it's routing it on the background, and I don't think I have any workflow for this one. Just what I just did was remove all those flags, cancel the workflow, and start it over. Add-ins can definitely be one of those other tools in your tool belt for designing the better UI. And they're not limited to just here in the record screen. You can put them up in the toolbar, give people the ability to launch e-forms, to start processes, to kick off workflows. Um, we use them for all things, like QuickBooks, for instance. You can use it to synchronize your data with QuickBooks Online, whatever. All sorts of things you can do with it. And like the record screen where you have the add-in pop out here, plus you can put them here, you've got the same option in the toolbar. You can put them in the drop-down here if you like. So you can also embed them over here next to these most used things. So there's an expense report. That one actually just generated an expense report record and took me to it. There you go. I can start my work. Or here, this one's a data protection policy. This just pops, I think that pops up a window with a form in it. So I use something like this a lot for help. Like if you're putting a system in for a customer uh, and they then you help them develop some, uh, like a PDF of instructions or a how-to guide. You can embed that right on the toolbar with a little help icon, maybe a question mark icon, uh, so that all users can click on it and get right back to their documentation. Now you don't have to be called for trading all the time. All sorts of things you can do with it. But you do that similarly in the where and when to show. If you tell it to show in the toolbar, you can also tell it to go into the lower toolbar, which is this area down here. And then one last follow up here. If you do a search, you can do the same thing in searches. You actually have the ability to put add ins here. Let me, I think I have some on invoices. There we go. So we have some add ins here for invoices. So let's say I select three or four records. I can hit one of these. That's a validate vendor. This one's validate vendor reverse and forward. And this one is what is this? Oh, prompt test. It's going to prompt me for something. Okay. Um, that one would have actually, whatever I put in there would have been written into the records, set the invoice dates for all of them. Uh, but similarly, you can do the same thing. If you don't set them up here, there's a little drop down over here that shows up. 
but these are all outside, so they show up on the top bar. If I don't select any of these and I run it, it runs against all the records I searched, all but 74 of them in this case. You don't have to page through all pages and run them. You don't have to check them all on. You can just search up 10,000 records, go up here, hit the button, and it'll cycle through them. It might take a while, but it'll go through them all and do all the work. <laughs>